Hello. This particular PowerPoint, I really prefer to do it in class. I sort of approach it as my TED Talk for the class as an example. Unfortunately, we can't do that now, so I will present it to you as a video, as we have with everything else here. Typically, at the end of presentations, especially if you're an invited speaker, or if you are working somewhere and presenting ideas for um, your boss, there will be a session for question and answers at the end. There's a way to do it right, and there's a way to do it wrong. And what is frustrating sometimes in public speaking is that nowadays people like to think they can just interrupt the speaker and um, take the floor if, if something sort of strikes them as they have a question or whatever. And um, I would, we'll address that later, but it's important probably in the beginning of your speech to make it clear what the, what the parameters are, that you're going to speak and then you will entertain questions so they can, you know, maybe they can have a piece of paper to write down the questions or whatever, but that, um, you know, normally when that happens, it just causes the speaker to get off track. It uh, hurts the listening of the other people, and it's just downright rude when it's done. Now, if it's your boss or it's the owner of the company, that's another issue. But most of the time, uh, it's somebody who thinks they, they're trying to upstage you. And not to be negative, but, you know, that's often the case, and you don't want that to happen because it doesn't help you any. In this presentation, I'd like to look at why Q&A is important and why it's done, why it's not a good thing sometimes, or it, could, it can be negative, as, as we mentioned, if someone's trying to upstage you. Then we'll have my Ten Commandments, which will fall into the categories of the preparation, how to actually answer it in real time, and then the attitudes you need to have when you're in that situation. First of all, why would you have a... Q&A session because the person who asked you to speak and is sponsoring it um, wants you to, <laughs> especially if they're paying or there's you know some some reason for them to to want you there. You need to know that there will be Q&A so that you will save time. So that if they say, well, speak for 20 minutes, but that includes the Q&A, that could be a problem. And the Q&As need to be controlled, but you you do need to know about the time. It is a great opportunity to reemphasize major ideas and to enhance your credibility and to correct any misconceptions or misunderstandings that the audience may have, which will crop up in the questions. Sometimes their misunderstandings are intentional, but they can, they can be from something you didn't get right or weren't clear about. So there's a good reason to have Q&A, although it is frustrating and, and a little scary for some of us. Why would you not want to do Q&A is a very important question, too, though. You don't want to do it to kill time. If you're asked to speak for 30 minutes and you speak for 10 and then plan on having 20 minutes of Q&A, not a good strategy, not at all. Uh, that shows you have not prepared enough. And if you haven't given them enough to go on, they won't know what questions to ask. Then you've got a situation where they could ask you anything and you want to control the Q&A and not them get them um, off track. So that goes to the second point. It's not You don't want to have the Q&A because you didn't answer the audience's questions in the first place. If you think back to our first lecture in this unit on public speaking, you know the, the best speeches are the ones that answer the questions in the audience's mind. You have to be cognizant of their questions before they ask them. What's going to be interesting to them? What are they going to have? questions about. And if you aren't thinking about that, then you may be totally off base on what you're speaking on. Definitely not to show off and, and not to encourage any kind of debate, um, depending on the topic. So here we get into the three areas of preparation, how to answer, and the attitudes. And I call these uh, 10 commandments only because 10 is a nice round number. Obviously, you need to know the format, the time, and the expectations beforehand. Of course, you always need, need to know more than you have time to say in the speech. Hopefully that 
this the information you give in the speech is only a fraction of what you really know. You definitely don't want to be blindsided by the fact that they're going to be Q&A and you didn't know about that. But you also want to know the format. Sometimes questions will be submitted by cards. That, that's a good way because then it's very anonymous. Uh, the bad side of that is that sometimes the questions aren't clearly written and people have to read handwriting that isn't very good. Uh, nowadays, sometimes you'll have electronic versions, which will be through Twitter or some sort of sc streaming uh, screen thing. And that, that's a good way, too. But uh, generally, it's, it's going to be uh, more face-to-face -face or low-tech. There might be a microphone set up in the middle of the room where people can come and speak. And uh, that's helpful because then everybody can hear. Uh, there might be somebody running around with a microphone, which is really not the best uh, method. I've seen that a lot of times, and it's kind of silly. And uh, if, if the room is small enough, then, you know, probably a microphone is not needed. But you need, you need to go into it knowing that there's some sort of system um, that, that will be in place for the Q&A. After a person asks you a question, and keep in mind that... Um, really ask, you might think, oh, everybody just want to ask a question, but some people, it's very hard for them to ask questions. And and I would say, first of all, before you get, get uh, even into this, don't expect the questions to come immediately. Some people will have to formulate them. Some people have to get up the nerve. So, um, the, you know, it's just not an automatic thing. So I often, uh, in my classes, students will I'll say, are there any questions or what questions do you have? And I'll just stand there and wait because I know that I'm not going to get questions within five seconds. So be aware of that too. It takes a while. Uh, so once the person, the first person asks a question, for example, repeat the question, not because, or, or put it in your own words, perhaps, maybe paraphrase it so that it will allow you to be sure that you heard it correctly and that um, you, it is what they are asking and that the others, if there's no microphone, they could have heard it. And it's also a stalling tactic. <laughs> it helps you to think. You, it gives you time to think. When you rephrase or repeat the question, make sure that is what they are asking. So you might ask them if that's how you're understanding it correctly. And you don't want to waste time on the wrong question, obviously. Thank the person for the question. Now that may seem a little uh, unnecessary, but as I said, some people find it hard to stand up and ask questions. Again, it gives you some time to stall, but it's also polite and it helps your credibility in front of the audience. You know, credibility is a funny thing. Some people are credible because they're very, very knowledgeable and have a great deal of expertise, but we don't know them personally and we may not think that they're a particularly warm person. So if you can do anything that's polite, uh, that would add to the likability part of the credibility as well. When you answer the question, direct it to the whole audience. Don't just look at the person who answered, uh, who asked the question. That can be uh, embarrassing and it almost becomes a private conversation and that's not something you want. It's, it's for the whole audience. And therefore you have to be aware of the whole audience. Don't just look at one side of the room. And and also we come into the problem that if there are people who are raising their hands, you have to keep straight in your head who had their hand raised. And that can be fun. But again, be aware of the whole audience. You're speaking to them. And this is true of all public speaking. We all have a natural bias to look left or right. And uh, we might be tempted to just look at one side of the room and I have to make myself look at the left side of the room. I just bias toward right. I'm left-brained and go that way. So you, uh, you need to be aware of that. In your answer, it's important that you don't get off track and bring up new information that's not, or, or go in a direction that's not really in your speech. And if they ask you a question that uh, is related to the topic, uh, that's fine. But if it's it's in another area, you, you need to be careful about that and not going off in a different direction or, um, you know, into an area where you're not really prepared to speak about. 
consequently, you need to stay in time limits. And this is, of course, the, the job, really, of the moderator or the person who sponsored you. But if you know there's five minutes, be aware that it's five minutes. And that, and that might be that you don't want to get long-winded in your answers. So that if you know you have five minutes for Q&A and you have several hands raised, you want to get to as many as possible. So you don't want to spend a minute, two minutes or more on the first question because that's going to get into problems. And, and that brings us to the, the next area where it's about your attitudes. First of all, be honest. Uh, some people cannot admit that they just don't know, but it's all right to say, you know, that's not something I have that information about right now, but where you can find that is and direct them. If they really want to know it, they can go to the, the website or the source or the book and find out the information. Uh, it's, it's all right to not know everything. It, it may not have been relevant and, um, and now it may have been, but, and you, you know, hopefully you do know it, but it may, if it's irrelevant or if it's just sort of outside the bonds of the speech, often you will get this about, someone will ask you about statistics and most of us don't carry statistics around in our head and figures and facts like that. Uh, we might know some, but not a whole bunch. So you might say, well, I don't, you know, I don't have that exact data right with me, but where you can find that I know is at the blank blank. And that can be helpful. So um, they can look it up. But at the same time, don't apologize. Uh, a lot of us have a default to say, well, I'm sorry, I just, no, don't say you're sorry. <laughs> um, I'm trying to, to break all of us, it's, uh, including myself, of saying I'm sorry. Um, saying it when you're not really sorry is a little bit dishonest. So no reason to apologize if you can't ask answer a question. It may be that there is no answer or it's just not relevant. Finally, and as far as your attitudes, is avoid defensiveness. You don't want to get into a debate with people. And at the same time, you don't want to assume that they're trying to stump or embarrass you. Even if they are, you don't want to assume that. And debates, um, de you know, defensiveness never comes out well. And you'd want to uh, be sure that you remain in control. That's the whole thing. With Q&A and public speaking in general, you want to re remain in control. So embrace Q&A. It can be very good. It can be a lot of fun. Sometimes the Q&A is the best part. You can also take advantage of the Q&A to reinforce your main points and sort of put another um, um, fork in the stake, so to speak, to really, to really uh, make, it make a good conclusion at the end of your speech. Thank you.